Heavenly Father, we come before your presence humbly, Lord, knowing that you hear us from the throne room of heaven. God, we know that each prayer request that was mentioned in this place and those that didn't have time or take the time, Lord, that you know the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. God, we know that from the throne room of glory, you see the hurting, you see the pain, the suffering. You see the ones that's going through the stress test with the hurt fingers and the grandbabies, Father, that have stomach problems. We know that your infirmities of the people are not unnoticed. They don't go unaware, but we know that Jesus is our intercessor, and he's sitting on the throne room of glory, and he heard each prayer request. And, Father, we pray tonight that your healing virtue will flow straight out of the throne room of glory and touch these prayer requests. I pray, Father, that there will be testimonies come Sunday that your miracles have been performed once again as we believe with faith, without wavering, knowing that you're an almighty God. But we pray as we enter into this service that you'll anoint your word, your preaching. Send the Holy Ghost fire in this place to let us understand the scripture. God, we also take just a moment to pray for an offering that we're about to receive. For those that have to give, we pray that you'll bless them tremendously. And those that don't, we know you certainly understand the needs and the circumstances. Father, we give you glory and honor in this place. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Do we have anyone that normally takes up an offering in this place? And I already said if we didn't, that's okay. And if we don't, that's fine. I hope you realize I'm excited. I'm ready to get into the Word. Brother, don't give up. I expect to see you Sunday at Sunday school again. We had a great one last week. Grandbabies, bring them. Okay? We do have an offer attendant. Come on in, Kim. The prayer has been said. Y'all take just a moment, reach deep in your pockets, and do what the Lord tells you to do as Kim comes by and takes up the offer. As I said, the pastor of this board is retreating. This is their time. So pray for them that they'll have safety. Pray for them that they'll have a really, really good time. And pray that the Lord will keep all their families safe while they're away. I don't know if uh, they're on their knees praying right now for this church service, but I'll about bet you they are or have already. Okay? So I know that their hearts is here even though that they're away. Turn with me to Mark chapter 1. I'm going to title this message simply 143. Now, this is not message 143 that I've preached. It's not message 143 that I've studied or taught. But I simply want to call this message 143, and we'll find out later why. In Mark chapter 1, you'll see that uh, Jesus is just fixing to start his ministry. Okay? I want to start at verse 1, and then I'm going to go through verse 4, and then I'm going to skip a few verses and pick up again. I will be reading from the King James Version. Mark 1 and 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness, and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. I'm going to skip to verse 14. Now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. I want to skip to verse 22. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Skip with me one more time, would you, to verse 27. And they were all amazed in so much that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commandeth even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. 143 is a number I want you to remember. We're going to come back to that number later. Now, for y'all that don't know me, I cannot stand still. Just forgive me, okay? So John comes preaching and preparing the way. And John is preaching repentance. Luke, he's preaching repentance because he's concerned that people's lives are changed. They learn the doctrine. They learn what the Bible's all about. They understand that we're here and we're going to have an eternity one way or another. We're either going to spend eternity in heaven or hell. We understand that. Nobody's going to escape those two points. So we know that John came preaching the baptism of repentance. But they put John in prison for preaching the baptism of repentance. They also put him in prison, if you remember, 
if you read the scriptures, remember for, for just basically drawing large crowds, he drew so many people to him that it was causing a ruckus. So here comes John. He's put in prison, and here comes Jesus right behind John. Are they preaching a different doctrine? Did you pick up on that term that says, what new doctrine is this? Did you get that in verse 27? What new doctrine? Well, it had to be a new doctrine, did it not? Because, see, Jesus came to preach himself the Messiah, the Savior of the world that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus came to establish himself so that he could die on the cross of Calvary, bleed and die for your and my sins. Is that not a new doctrine? It is a new doctrine. You see, they were used to the blood of bulls and goats. Hilton, they were used to going out there and getting a spotless lamb and bringing that spotless lamb on the Day of Atonement and having the priest kill that spotless lamb, take that blood, apply it to the four corners of the altar, sprinkle that blood on the altar, and give that blood as a payment for the sacrifice of the sins of the people. And each one of them had to do that on the Day of Atonement. Now, I don't know about you. I can't wait till the Day of Atonement once a year to ask forgiveness for my sins. Am I saying I sin every day? No. But I know that my Savior that lives inside of me, He draws my spirit in daily because He told me to die daily. And I know that in myself, sometimes I've got to say, Lord, today I didn't act like I should have acted. Lord, today I might not have done the things I should have done. So sometimes I'm so thankful that we don't have to wait for the Day of Atonement to come in before we go find a little lamb and take it before a priest and say, I hope he does his job right. Because if the priest didn't do it just right, I would be fearful that my sacrifice wasn't accepted. So it was a new doctrine. Do you realize that the Mosaic Law started in 1490 B.C.? 1490 B.C., Malachi is 397 B.C. You add another 400 years, and we're looking at roughly 2,200 years that they were under the same doctrine. The same doctrine. You go get you a little lamb, or you go get two turtle doves. You go get whatever the Mosaic law said you could afford, and you bring it before the priests for your sins. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had me a little lamb... And we used to raise goats. I'm an old country boy. We used to raise goats. They're the cutest little thing when they're about a month old. When they go hopping all over that field, they're just funny and cute. But I don't know about you, but I have to wonder, if I had me a little lamb and I watched the mama birth that little lamb into the world, and that little lamb run all over the field, and I watched it grow, and I'm waiting on the day of atonement, and it's not here yet, and I know that I've sinned against my Lord and Savior. I've sinned against God. And i got to wait just, say, two or three or four or five months for that day to come. Now, we know there's peace offerings, and there's trespass offerings. We know there's sin offerings. But the Day of Atonement came at a certain period of time. I don't know what you would do. But I know that if I had watched that little baby lamb grow into maturity, and five, six months later, the Day of Atonement is fastly approaching. And I slipped out there on the Day of Atonement to go get that precious little lamb to take to the priest to offer him for the sacrifice of my sins. And he was gone, missing. And I might not have another spotless lamb in, the, in, in my pasture. I might not have but one spotless lamb in my pasture. In my fields, there might not be another one that fit that perfect, spotless, without spot and blemish mold. You know how my heart would feel if on that morning I got up and went to gather that spotless lamb and somebody come in the, st in the still of the night and stole my spotless lamb? You think about it. That's the doctrine of Mosaic law. That's the doctrine of the Old Testament. You find your sacrifice and bring it before the priest. Miss Betty, I would feel crushed to know that I watched that little baby lamb that is going to pay the payment for my sins and find out the morning before the Day of Atonement, he's gone. Why is he gone? It could be the man that stole him wants to eat him for lunch. It could be the man that stole him don't have a sacrifice for his own sins. It could be that the man that took him from me 
has a different reason to use that lamb than what I had. Now do you see why he had to change the doctrine? Now do you see just one scenario of why he had to change that doctrine? I'm so glad 2,000 plus years ago, my Lord and Savior come and hung on the cross of Calvary and he changed the doctrine of the Old Testament law. I would be crushed to know that my sacrifice was no longer available. I would be crushed to know that I watched that precious lamb grow up and when the day of atonement comes, I'm panicking and I've got to go find another sacrifice. I've got to go buy two turtle doves. Why? Because my lamb is gone. I'm so thankful that he changed the doctrine once and for all. He changed the doctrine so that you and I could at any given time fall on our knees like, oh God, I sinned and come short of the glory of God. That at any given time we could say, God, if you'll suck me back, I'll come back with open arms. God, I beg for your mercy. I beg for your grace. That's why he changed the doctrine. The people were amazed and they were astonished at his preaching and his teaching. But LB, it don't stop there. We skipped a lot of verses. I want to talk to you about the unclean spirit in the sanctuary. Do you realize that man come into the church house just like you have tonight and he had an unclean spirit inside of him? He didn't need to wait for the day of atonement. He didn't need to wait for the Mosaic law to say it's not time yet for you to present it to the priest. You see, the priest could only go into the Holy of Holies once a year. Judy, I'm so glad he changed the doctrine once and for all. You realize that that man was in the house just like you and I am tonight, but yet he had an unclean spirit within him. He didn't need to go find two turtle doves. He didn't need to go find a bull, a bullock. He didn't need to go find a spotless lamb. He was in the right place. Can I encourage you to bring the sinners? Can I encourage you to bring them and hear the doctrine that Hilliard First Assembly teaches? We teach it every Sunday morning in Sunday school. We teach it every time Arlie gets behind this pulpit. He's preaching you the doctrine of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He's telling you if you'll compel them to come into this house, he'll give them the word of God. He'll present to them the doctrine that says their lives can be changed once and for all. Their lives can be changed forever. He told that man of an unclean spirit to come out. You know what the unclean spirit did? He tore him and he ripped him. It's right there in Mark chapter 1. He said, okay, but before I do, I'm going to tear that man. LB, we've been there. We've seen our, skin, our sins that are so dark. I'm sorry, people, with a hard of hearing, you don't really know how you're pronouncing your words. Okay? We have seen our sins so dark and so deep in sin that we beg Jesus Christ to forgive us and when he does, he wipes them away. He casts them in the sea of forgetfulness is a term. It actually says as far as the east is from the west. He takes our transgressions, Luke, and he forgets them. And he doesn't ever remember my transgressions against me again. He never once, Hilton says, you remember what you did 10 years ago? 15 years ago, 20 years ago, no man might remember, but my Lord and Savior says, I have forgiven them and I have forgotten them. And he will never, ever, never bring my sins up again. This spirit, this unclean spirit tore that man. Jesus is standing there watching. Jesus done commanded him to come out. And that unclean spirit tears him and rips him. Now Luke chapter 4 verse 18, the same description says, but he hurt him not. You see, when an unclean spirit is in a man, this is the place they should be. Briefly, the Bible says signs and wonders shall follow them that believe. Briefly, the Bible says after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall do great things. He told the disciples, hey, don't you joy because the evil spirits are subject to you. You rejoice because your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. Miss Betty, he knows what we have need of. We had a, a, a business meeting here on a Sunday night in January. Two weeks before the business meeting, I felt compelled to go to my dad's church. Me and Allison was talking, and she said something about the service. Am I going to be here? And I said, I hope not. I think I might have said that wrong and didn't portray a good message. I, she, we got, she said something about, oh, we're going to play music. Maybe I asked. I said, if they ask us to play music, please tell them no. I think I shocked her again. I had something compelling me. Usually when I go to my dad's church, I preach. I didn't know it was the fifth Sunday scene. I went to his church. We began to sing the songs of Zion. 
And in about an hour into it, a woman hit the altar and began to pray. Black hair, black fingernails, black shirt, black everything. Don't you take nothing about that. And she just had on black clothes. Hilton, I'm telling you like I'm standing right here. That woman was demon-possessed. Most people don't see that in America today. Most people in our churches don't understand that our Lord changed that doctrine because there's hurting people out here, demon-possessed people out here. And he said, if you'll come unto me, I will give you rest. He said, come unto me, all ye that are burdened and heavy laden. We began praying for that woman at a scene. And we began praying. There was a 91-year-old preacher, an 80-year-old preacher, and my dad's 73 and myself. Shelly, we began praying for her. We began praying, Lord, she needs you. He changed this doctrine so that we would have power to cast out devils. We prayed for 45 minutes, foam coming out of her mouth, on her hands and knees, four hands and knees down like a dog growling, her face red, her eyes so pitch black dark. She is growling at us every time we touch her, every time we pray for her. See, but we have gotten away from that in America. We accept people, which is great. We need to accept them in this house. But we need to be sensitive to the Spirit. And we began to pray for that woman. In about 45 minutes, she leaned back on her hands and knees and began to say the name of Jesus. Jesus. About 45 minutes, she began to say the name of Jesus. Jesus changed his doctrine so that we could be delivered from evil, so that our sins could be forgiven. You say, you're not scared of touching her, not one bit. LB, I wasn't scared to put my hands on her and pray for her, not one bit. You say, you had your hand on her when a, yes, when a devil was in here, in her. You know why I'm not scared? The blood of Jesus covers up this five foot six body from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, all 164 pounds of me. He covered me from the head to the toe. He covered my fingertips. And when I put my hand on her, I was not scared one bit. I wasn't worried that that devil was gonna jump out and get on me because he cannot cross the bloodline. That bloodline that's applied to my life covers me in everything I do, everything I say, as long as I do according to his will. He cannot cross that bloodline. Why are we so worried and scared of evil today? We don't have to be. Jesus changed the doctrine. A few moments later, you find them in verse 30 at Peter's mama's house. Now, he just called Peter to be his disciple in some of those verses we skipped around 10 and all that area. He finds himself in Peter's mama's house and she's sick with a fever. What are you saying? I'm saying this doctor says we could cast out devils in Jesus' name. I'm saying this doctor says if any of he's sick among you, let him call the elders of the church. Let them anoint them with the oil and pray the prayer of faith. And they have committed any sins, it shall be forgiven them and they shall be healed. This doctrine that he's changed says we don't have to wait to be healed. We don't have to wait to be forgiven. We find him in Peter's mother's house. He simply takes her by the hand. And he grabs her by the hand and he lifts her up. And that fever disappears. You say, are you Jesus? No way. There's none like him. Do you realize the authority he had was given to him by God? God gave him all authority under heaven and earth. But he said, greater things than these can you do. He said, that Holy Ghost that was in you will give you power to tread on serpents. He lifted her by the hand and she was immediately healed. And we find her ministering unto Jesus. I think she went in to cook lunch. Maybe supper. I don't know. But I think that's what it means. Do you realize that he changed the doctrine so that you and I don't have to wait for our healing. I don't like clocks. So that you and I don't have to wait for our healing. Shelly, I know I can't hear well. I know I pray almost daily. Lord, why me? Why can't you heal my hearing? People, I get up there and do my utmost best on that bass guitar. And I will until the day he tells me to quit. I simply do the best I can. Sometimes it's off note, off key, off beat, off everything. Sunday morning it wouldn't even come on to start to get off. I couldn't get it off because it wouldn't come on until halfway through the first song. What am I telling you? He loved me so much. He looked beyond my faults and he saw my needs. He loved me so much that he went to Calvary. He said, you know, this doctor's not working for you, Billy Haddon. He said, in 2015, when you need me, I want you to walk into your prayer closet. I want you to bow on your knees and pray to an almighty God. And I'll hear from heaven, and I'll hear your prayers, and I will answer, he said. 
Miss Betty, he promised me that. I don't have to depend on a priest. Oh, but it doesn't stop there. You go on down to verse 40, and there's a leopard. And the leopard comes to Jesus. Now, we've talked about demons. we talked about healing. And then we talk about a physical disability. Leprosy was not meant for the children of God. Leprosy was not meant for God's people. Do you realize it started in Egypt as a plague? It did not start in Israel. It did not start in the promised land. It did not start in Canaan land. It was not designed for God's people. But God's people started mixing and mingling with Egyptians and the pagan people. So we find a man in verse 40, and he's got leprosy. And he comes to Jesus. He says, Lord, if thou wilt, I canst be made whole. He didn't say, hang on. Let me go get my little lamb. Let me go find two turtle doves. That's not what he said. He said our grandbabies can be healed because Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He said, is it expedient for you that I go away? For if I go not away, the comforter will not come. But when he comes, he will tell of me. And he'll give us strength. He'll be our leader and our guide and our helper. That's what he said. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father right now making intercession. He hears every time one of his children calls his name. He hears. This leper came to Jesus and said, If thou wilt, I can't be made whole. You realize our Bible says Jesus had compassion on him? Compassion. Jesus is one of authority. Why, he's had authority since he was 12 years old when he went into the temple. And he began to preach the gospels. Actually, he began to preach the prophets. And they looked on him and they said, what is this? Where did he learn all of this? Twelve years old, Jesus had authority that the doctors and the lawyers were amazed. We heard that word tonight in verse 27. At what a twelve-year-old boy was doing. You see, he's God in the flesh. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among men. Why did he do that? So that he could change the Old Testament doctrine because it wasn't working. He had to change to a more perfect plan. He had to change that doctrine so that any given time you and I could fall on our knees. He had compassion on the leopard. He said, I will be thy clean. But it didn't stop there. See, the fever left Peter's mother immediately. You see, the, the spirit left the man in the synagogue after he ripped him and torn him. He was immediately healed, this leper. But Jesus told him, Go, show thyself unto the priest for all the cleansings, the ceremonial cleansings that Moses has said were still intact. See, Jesus has not yet died on the cross at this point in time. He's only starting the ministry of a new doctrine. And he told him, says, don't you forget now, this Old Testament is still in attack. In attack. You go before the priest. You realize that took eight days? Eight days it took for him to go before the priest to offer his sacrifice, shave his head and the hair on his body, and burn it, burn his clothes. I don't know about you. When I need my Lord to say, I'm not waiting eight days, brother. When I've done something that shames our Lord, I'm not waiting eight days. I'm going to immediately, as soon as I can find me a place, Donna, to pray. And I would say, oh, God of heaven, I'm so glad you sent Jesus Christ on Calvary. I'm so glad you sent him to a borrowed tomb. And I'm so glad you raised him on the third day. And I'm so glad he's interceding for me. See, I'm not waiting eight days. You know what happens when folks come to the house of God and they feel convicting power and they get up and leave? In eight days, you know what happens? That convicting power has ceased. It has dissipated. That convicting power has dwindled down. It now no longer has the effect it has when the pastor was standing here on Sunday morning calling you to a place of prayer. It no longer has an effect on you Monday morning and Tuesday morning when you get up and go to work and you don't feel that spirit drawing you to an altar that was there when the pastor was preaching to you on Sunday and begging you to come before an altar of prayer. That's why he changed the doctrine. 
He changed the doctrine because it wasn't working. The doctrine is changing again. Do what? Yes, this doctrine is changing again. Huh? I don't see that in the Bible. You don't. You know the spirit of Antichrist is already here. You know as we're studying Revelation that in the last days there's going to be false teachers and false prophets? Oh my goodness. For over 2,000 years the doctrine has been changed. The evil of this world is going to again try to change the doctrine. There's going to be a false prophets. There's going to be false teachers a false antichrist. There's going to be people saying he's no longer that Jesus that cast the devil out of the unclean man in the temple. They're going to say he's no longer the same Jesus that healed Peter's mother and cleansed the leper from his sins. You realize they're going to try to dilute this gospel. There will be teachers with each and ears. Miss Betty, they're going to try to dilute this gospel so that it doesn't have the same meaning it has today. 2,015 plus years after our Lord and Savior came. Hilton, they're going to try to change the gospel to be of none effect. None effect is what you feel on Monday when you deny the spirit that's drawing you. He said, my spirit will not always strive on man. You realize he gives us an opportunity because he put in us a measure of faith to every one of us. And he gives us an opportunity to be saved before we pass from this life into the next life. But he don't give us over and over and over and over and over again. Because he says he'll not always strive for man. There comes a time when he'll turn you over to a reprobate mind and he'll let you believe a lie. That lie is coming. As we study revelations, can you sense in your spirit how close the church world is to the end? Can you sense in your spirit how close the Lamb of Lambs, the King of Kings, is to splitting those eastern skies? Can you sense with everything you've ever read about the Bible, everything you've ever studied, and everything you ever know, that the end is getting closer and closer and closer. Can you possibly sense in your spirit that it's almost over? I've read on the internet, I don't know if it's true, in a way I hope it is, in a way I hope it's not, but they say this world could end this year. I'm not prophesying that. No man knows the day or the hour. We know that. They say that America could crash this year. I'm not prophesying that. I'm not prophesying anything. He called me to teach and preach and play music the best I can, not to prophesy. This I do know. You can't be a Christian in this world, in America in which we live, and see all the filthiness that's in America and all the ungodliness that's in our country and say we're still one nation under God. You can't look at all the sin that America has allowed to happen and know that we're not in the end times, Luke, that we're not getting closer and closer to the rapture of the church, that we're not getting to that point where he splits out of Jesus Christ. He calls the dead in Christ out, and those which are alive wouldn't remain shall meet him in the air. We're getting so close, church, I can almost feel it. I wonder if he's not standing in the portals of glory looking over now saying, God, can I go now? Would you turn me loose? Would you let me call my bride home? Would you give me an opportunity now, oh God? Let me just call him home now. I wonder if he's not saying, come on, Father, come on, they're mine. I'm ready. The pastor preached to us about the bride of the church being the bride of Christ last Wednesday, Sunday, last Sunday night. He pre Could you sense, could you possibly in your mind sense that it's coming to an end, church? I do. I sense it. There's so much evil in this country. And it's getting worse day by day. And I know time's going to run out. So I'm going to let you not forget that number 143. And I'm going to let you not forget it's been it over 2,000 years ago. I'm so thankful he changed the doctrine to what it is today. I'm more grateful and thankful that here your first assembly God teaches and preaches it on a weekly basis. I want to read you a a verse 24. This is the unclean spirit. Now they were questioning the doctrine and authority of Jesus Christ. They were questioning it. This world is going to question it again. Some already do. Verse 24 says... This is to the man in the synagogue with the unclean spirit. He's saying, let us alone. That's that evil spirit. Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? 
Aren't thou come to destroy us? I know who thou art, the Holy One of God. Some people were amazed. Some people were astonished. We read that in verse 22 and verse 27. But we also saw people saying, what is this new doctrine? I don't understand it. With what authority does he cast out the evil spirits? We might not understand it, but the evil spirits in this world do. They do. They did in verse 24. The evil spirits in this world know that our time is getting close. And they're trying every way possible to take the Christian and cause him to backslide, to give up, to lose hope, to quit on God. When we're that close to the kingdom of God, when we're that close to the promised land, this evil spirit says, I know who thou art, Jesus of Nazareth. We studied the Nazarite vow, a doctrine in our class, didn't we, Paul? Paul walked in at exactly the perfect time. And we picked up Paul and had a little fun with him. And we do that in our class, don't we? We're kind of crazy, I know. But do you realize that evil spirit knew the Jesus of Nazareth? He knew that he was a holy one. And he knew that he had come from God. How dare they question the authority of our Lord and Savior when the evil spirits themselves know where he came from? How dare they question his doctrine when the heavenly Father sent him to a virgin Mary and all the angels cried out loud in the heavens? Even when he was baptized, did not the voice from heaven come down and say, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased? People, they heard that with their ears. They heard that with their human ears. And they knew that that was Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God. And yet people today are rejecting him as Christ. They live their life as if there's no end and there's no tomorrow. They live their life as there's not going to be a worry in this world that we're okay, that we'll make it. I don't know about you. I know about me and me only. And I'm so thankful that now I have to give account for myself only. I wish I could tell you, all oh, you're dismissed, never worried about it again. I'll take care of it for you, but I can't. Jesus did. He changed the doctrine so that you can have peace that passeth all understanding, not as the world gives, give unto you. He changed the doctrine. I don't have to wait a year to go back and have the day of atonement show up. I don't have to have and take that chance of somebody stealing my lamb. 143. What does it have to do with this message? And we're getting close to closing. 143, Josh. I went to a funeral Friday. It seems like every time I turn around now, there's a funeral. I went to a funeral Friday, Josh. A man was 92 years old. In 1967, he loaded his wife and eight kids up and came to Florida. He had a truck and a car. Everything he was on was in those two vehicles, Miss Betty. He had a flat tire and a messed up rear end. Finally got the rear end going, and at 30 miles an hour, they come from north, I believe it's Pennsylvania, to Live Oak, Florida. 30 miles an hour, can you imagine? It took them over a week to get here. Eight children. They got to Florida, they had their ninth children, their ninth child. He passed away Sunday, and we buried him Friday. LB, the man had nine children. It's right there, I've got it written down. He had 35 grandchildren. He had 87 great-grandchildren. And Miss Betty, he had 12 great-great-grandchildren. That equals 143. A 92-year-old man died and left 143 descendants in Live Oak, Florida. The funeral was a great time. Big church, big high roof. Big, nice cedar timbers going up. 143 descendants. And actually, Esther, a friend of mine, said there's more on the way. He's not seen yet. What are you saying? I'm saying that man left a legacy to 143 descendants that this is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He lived every day 
for Jesus Christ. He was a worker in the church. Even at 92 years old, got sick a week later, died. Even at 92 years old, he was a worker in the church. He believed at 92 that he was the same Jesus yesterday, today, and forever. That he believed when he got saved as a 21-year-old man. 92 years old, he lived his life. This is the doctrine of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Don't you believe anything else? Y'all remember a year or so ago, maybe longer, when we went through all the different denominations and we taught them here on Wednesday night? This isn't Jehovah Witness. This isn't Mormons. This isn't, Donna, you remember, this isn't any other than doctors that we taught in this place. This is the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He came to change your life. He came to change my life. He came to be the propitiation or the payment for my sins, Miss Betty, and the sins of the whole world. The same doctrine that saved Mr. Anders will save all 143 of his descendants. He wasn't ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wasn't ashamed to tell you he was a Christian and he loved the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. He wasn't ashamed to teach to those grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren the Bible, the Holy Bible, the Holy Word of God, inspired by men of old as they were moved on by the Holy Ghost. I have to wonder how much of an effect those 143 descendants will have as they go out like John did and preach the gospel. As they go out like Jesus did and preach the gospel, Miss Betty. And this world and these enemies of this world are going to fight the gospel in every way. I feel like in the last two months, since January, when we had that ordeal with that demon, Hilton, I feel like every demon of hell comes against me. On the job, at home, with our family, with our work, found out just this week, I'm now on call every eight weeks for Florida, Georgia. Thank you. Didn't pay us an extra dime, never do. Miss Betty, it seemed like every devil in hell has come against me. Judy, it seems just like everything we touch goes wrong. It seems like he fights us on every end, tooth and nail. I got word for him. <laughs> that doctrine that they were worried about, my Savior died on the cross of Calvary. He bled and he died on a whole rugged cross so that I could find a place to pray and say, God, I need your help. When the demons of hell are fighting us, I can take a stand against him. And he said he'll raise up a standard against him. I can call on the precious name of Jesus Christ. And he said if you will resist the devil, he will flee from you. Judy, when I'm sick, I can call for his healing. When I feel unclean, I can call for his cleansing. I hate to close. I hate to stop this message. I hate to. I hope my clock is 15 minutes off and it's not. I hate to stop. Why? It means so much to me. The doctrine that our Savior died for means so much to me. I want to live it. I want to tell it. I want to show it. But more important, <laughs> more important, him. <laughs> I want to take my foot and put it on that devil's head because he said we have power to tread on serpents. Josh, we can take the power of the cross and we can stand on the demons of hell and we can tell him he's not only a liar but he's the father of all liars. And no matter what happens, we can lift our voice to an almighty God and say thank you God for healing my soul, for changing my life, for setting me free, for dying on the cross. The blood has been applied, Luke, and I don't have to worry about anything. I can give him praise and I can give him glory in this house and you should be able to do the same. And if you can't, there's an altar right down here. If you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, there's a place to pray. I trust that everybody in this house does. But I assure you this world don't know him like I know him. I know this. My Redeemer lives. And he lives deep down in the center of my heart. And my Bible says there's nothing that can take him away. There's nothing, there's nothing that can take his love away from me. There's nothing that will keep us out of his love. There's nothing, there's no sin 
There's no shame or no sickness that can keep us. Neither depth nor height can keep us from the love of God. Would you stand with me in this house?